Hello and welcome to the Ohio Health EMS Summer Update at Grant Medical Center. My name is Eric Cortez. I serve as the System Medical Director for Ohio Health EMS. Thank you for joining me for this presentation. We're going to be discussing cardiac emergencies for the next 30 minutes or so. I think a lot of times when we think about cardiac emergencies, our minds automatically go towards STEMIs and cardiac ischemia. But in this talk, we're going to talk about a variety of different types of cardiac emergencies. When we think about the heart, the heart serves as a pump. So we can have pump problems that can cause emergencies. And on the pump, we have plumbing and we have an electrical system that can also go bad and cause emergencies. And then we can have things outside or external of the heart that can lead to cardiac emergencies as well. So we'll talk about all those different types of cardiac emergencies. And if you have any questions, because this is a virtual edition, please feel free to email me at eric.cortez at ohiohealth.com. So we're gonna go through several cases to, to illustrate our cardiac emergencies. So this is our first case of a 62 year old male that calls 911 for sudden onset of chest pressure located in the center of his chest with radiation to the left arm. When you arrive on scene, he's diaphoretic uh, and hypertensive and he's complaining of chest pain. So think about what you would do in that scenario. As always, you arrive on scene in the, and the main question is always, is this patient sick or not sick? And when you look at this patient, this patient looks sick. One of my mentors would always say that if a patient's diaphoretic, you should be diaphoretic, meaning that diaphoresis is an ominous sign for critical illness. So this patient has sudden onset of chest pain, uh, he's 62 and diaphoretic. So you, obviously have cardiac emergencies on your differential, and in particular, cardiac ischemia. So you obtain a 12 lead EKG, and it is shown on the screen here. So walking through this EKG, I think obviously there's some ST elevation that pops out of you right away. But an important point to make about EKGs is to maintain a systematic approach to working through reading an EKG. So is the sinus, is there a P before every QRS? Uh, are the intervals normal? What are the uh, ST segment and T waves doing? So going through this, we see that we have a normal sinus rhythm. It looks like there's P waves before every QRS, but the big thing is uh, contiguous ST elevation and two or more leads, looking at one AVL, and then really from V2 through, through V6 of the precordial leads with reciprocal depression in lead three and AVF, and we see some depression in AVR as well. So this pattern in this patient presentation is consistent with an ST segment elevation myocardial infarction or a STEMI. And this is one of the main reasons why we obtained 12 lead EKGs in the pre-hospital setting. This case was fairly classic uh, with the clinical presentation. However, what we're learning more and more as we have more and more studies that come out on the epidemiology surrounding STEMIs is that STEMIs have a variety of presentations and sometimes it's crushing pain, sometimes it's sharp pain. Sometimes it radiates to the left arm, sometimes it goes to the right arm. Especially in older folks, those with comorbidities like diabetes, they can present with atypical symptoms where you might just have nausea or you might have syncope or you might have some back pain and shortness of breath rather than the classic chest pain. So STEMIs are time critical diagnoses. We need to get STEMI patients to definitive care as quickly as possible. Therefore, having a low threshold for obtaining 12 lead EKGs on scene for patients with the classic and atypical symptoms for STEMIs is gonna be really important to expedite not only your scene times, but also decrease time to definitive care for STEMIs. So STEMI management, I have it broken down into five steps, uh, five important things that we can do in the out of hospital setting. One of the things that we look at is getting an EKG quickly. So we arrive on scene and for our STEMI patients, having an EKG time of less than 10 minutes. And this is somewhat backward thinking, but this, what this means is that for the patients with those type of typical and atypical complaints, we need to be thinking EKG early. And then if it does show a STEMI, then we're able to use that information to do steps two through five as quickly as possible. So we, we arrive on scene and hopefully for our STEMI patients, we try and obtain a 12 lead EKG within 10 minutes and then transmit that to your receiving ED. Call a STEMI alert as soon as you can. Sometimes um, 
the STEMI alerts are not called until the radio report a few minutes away from the hospital. But as soon as you recognize that there's a STEMI occurring on your 12 lead EKG and you feel like the patient's having a STEMI, go ahead and call a STEMI alert as soon as possible. And that allows pre-notification and activation of the appropriate personnel and equipment and resources in the hospital setting to get the patient to definitive care. The third thing I have listed here is aspirin. Aspirin is the most important thing you can do in the treatment of STEMIs. Aspirin is an antiplatelet. It, what that means is that it, it, it inhibits the function of platelets, and it's actually been shown to have a mortality benefit in the setting of STEMI patients. So about one in 30, that's an estimation, about one in 30 patients need to be treated with aspirin to promote one survival. So those are, ter those are terrific numbers when it comes to a number needed to treat. So number needed to treat of aspirin is 30 to improve survival in one patient. So that's very significant and get that on board as soon as possible. Number four, the next step is to treat pain and sympathetic tone. And classically, we talk about nitroglycerin as a pain control option, uh, as well as morphine. I think a lot of the trend from a pre-hospital perspective is still to use nit nitroglycerin that helps out with pain uh, it's a vasodilator, so it theoretically can increase or promote coronary perfusion as well. And it can lower blood pressure, uh, lower heart rates, and decrease sympathetic tone. Uh, as well as fentanyl is now becoming more favorable, more so than morphine. Fentanyl's quick on, quick off, and it can provide pain control, but also decrease sympathetic tone as well. And that increased sympathetic tone, the fight or flight response, um, that can be detrimental in the setting of a STEMI. So treating pain with nitroglycerin, with fentanyl, is a great way to treat pain, decrease sympathetic tone, and hopefully promote some coronary perfusion as well and decrease the work of the heart. Then lastly, step five is oxygen therapy. And this is a classic treatment that we've all learned about in the, the, um, the, the classic teaching of MONA therapy. So morphine, oxygen, nitro, and aspirin for STEMI management. And I already mentioned that morphine is somewhat falling out of favor for a focus on nitro and, and fentanyl. Oxygen is one of those things where too much oxygen is just as bad as not enough oxygen. So hypoxia or hypoxemia and hyperoxemia, too much oxygen can have detrimental effects on ischemic tissue in the heart as well. So we don't just want to give oxygen blindly. We want to prevent hypoxia. We want to treat somebody that has a low oxygen level to make it normal but we're not trying to hyperoxygenate somebody, which can have detrimental effects. So give nitrogen as needed, and you don't need to have a, a pulse ox of 100%. It can be anywhere from 94 to 99% um, in order to get enough oxygen to the patient with the STEMI. So those are the five steps in STEMI management. And you know we, we mentioned definitive care as well. So these are things that we're basically doing in the pre-hospital setting. But when we talk about definitive care, for the most part, in most regions of central Ohio, most regions of the state, and then things get a little bit different in different areas of the country, but definitive care is going to the cath lab and basically having the clot in the coronary artery vacuumed out, and that allows reperfusion uh, to the cardiac tissue. And there's typically a clot in one of the three coronary vessels, either the RCA, uh, the LAD, or the circumflex. Those are the three coronary vessels. So that's definitive management and all the things that we do, need to, we need to keep in mind that we need to decrease time to definitive management. The sooner we get the patient with a STEMI to the cath lab, the better. So this is another EKG here that falls within the ischemia picture of cardiac emergencies. And we talked about STEMIs, but there's this other group of diagnoses that where Whereas a STEMI has complete occlusion of a coronary vessel, we have some other lesions and stuff we can see on a 12 lead that suggests that we have a very high grade occlusion that's gonna completely occlude shortly. So we need to be aware of some of these EKG changes. Sometimes we refer to these as non-ST segment elevation myocardial infarctions where you're likely gonna have some evidence of cardiac damage on blood work. Uh, but this is an example of, of one of those EKG findings, and we're gonna go through a few here of not quite STEMI criteria, but it's probably going to transition to that pretty quickly. So it's important to pick these things up 
very quickly. So if you look at this EKG here, we see in the precordial leads here, V1, V2, and V3, we see ST segment elevation as well as a biphasic T wave here. So biphasic T wave, it's positive and negative. It's positive and negative. So this is a concerning pattern. You know, not necessarily a STEMI because you don't really have reciprocal changes, um, but this is a concerning pattern. And this is called Wellens syndrome, and that can be indicative of a very high-grade occlusion in one of the coronary arteries. So if you see this, it's not necessarily a STEMI alert, but this should put you on high alert that this patient is having a cardiac emergency. This is another example of one of those borderline EKGs. Uh, and what we're seeing here is, again, in the precordial leads, and a lot of times we forget about these leads, but in a lot of the stuff we're talking about, the precordial leads are going to give you a lot of clues about cardiac emergencies. So this is one of those where we have, you know, these big T waves, hyperacute T waves that are higher than the QRS amplitude. And this is indicative of cardiac ischemia. This is, con this is called uh, De Winter's pattern or De Winter's T waves, where we have these big T waves. And again, that's suggestive of a very high-grade occlusion that's likely going to turn into a STEMI sooner than later. Another EKG pattern is concerning. Looking at this, AVR, you know, a little bit of elevation there. We don't talk about AVR at all, but you'll notice in the other leads, we have depression in one and two. Uh, we have some depression in AVL. We got these ST segment changes out here in the lateral precordial leads. So AVR with diffuse ST segment changes and depression. This is considered a left main pattern, um, and it, it can be uh, indicative of a high-grade left main artery before it branches uh, to the LAD and the circumflex, and that can be indicative of a high-grade occlusion. Sometimes this indicates that this is just diffuse disease in all of the coronary arteries as well. Um, not important to differentiate what it's telling you, but know that when you see this pattern, very high-grade occlusion and can transition to STEMIs very quickly. All right, so those are some patterns that we can recognize on an EKG. And I mentioned that, you know, coronary artery disease, ischemic heart disease occurs on a spectrum. We started with that STEMI example. We have these two or three different EKG patterns that are suggestive of high grades, high grade occlusions. And then we can have these nonspecific patterns that can be ischemic, just not a STEMI. And we see here, just going across here, ST segment depression, some T wave changes, we, we can have dynamic changes where we start out as depression and then eventually we start transitioning over to elevation, some T wave aversions on the right hand side of the screen. The key thing here is, you know, besides calling a STEMI alert, we're going to treat these the exact same way as a STEMI. Get an EKG quickly, transmit it to the hospital, give aspirin, uh, treat pain and decrease sympathetic tone and give oxygen as needed. But this would be an example of an end STEMI or, you know, active ischemia without ST segment elevation, all concerning patterns in the right clinical setting. All right, so that's dealing with our ischemic problems. Let's move on to some other type of cardiac emergencies. This is an EKG here, somebody with shortness of breath and some dyspnea. And you look at this EKG and, you know, again, P wave before every QRS, the intervals appear rather fine. Uh, no obvious ST segment elevation. Maybe in some of the leads, the SD segments look a little messy, but nothing really bad. Uh, but a few things to note, two items actually. Go down to the rhythm strips here, and we see in lead two, what we see here is, you know, these QRS complexes, they're very small or short, basically. So they're low amplitude. We also see they alternate in height. So tall, short, tall, short, tall, short, tall, short, the whole way across here. So they're alternating between high and low. So we have low voltage QRS complexes, and we call this al alteration, electrical alternance. And when you have those two findings in the right clinical setting, you think about a pericardial effusion and tamponade. So this is an ultrasound of the heart. Right ventricle is RV, right atrium is RA, left ventricle and left atrium. So this is just a picture of the heart. And then this bright white stuff around here, that's the pericardial sac. This black area here, this on ultrasound, this is called an area of, um, or this is called an, an anechoic area. Basically, it represents fluid. EFF stands for an effusion. So this is a pericardial effusion around the heart. So that shouldn't be there. There shouldn't be fluid around the heart. When there is, there's some type of process going on. 
but that process can get really, really big. There can be a lot of fluid that either a, a high volume accumulates there or a smaller volume accumulates in a short amount of time. And it can transition from a pericardial fusion, which can cause symptoms. But when that pressure gets high enough, and in particular higher than right ventricle pressure, you see collapse of the right ventricle here. So the walls of the right ventricle are touching here. And these arrows represent pressure pushing on the right side of the heart. So what happens, this is pericardial tamponade, and the heart swings within that fluid, which causes the electrical alternins as it swings back and forth. And then that fluid around the heart causes the QRS amplitude on your EKG to be short. Um, so that's, that's what we're finding there. And tamponade can, can lead to obstructive shock where you don't get any preload back to the heart. And if not treated appropriately, typically with a pericardiocentesis, then um, it can lead to PEA arrest as well. All right, this is our next case. Um, you know, this is a 35-year-old female that presents with pleuritic chest pain and shortness of breath. Um, she recently took a long car ride up from Florida to the state of Ohio and uh, was complaining of leg pain and then shortly afterwards developed the shortness of breath and pleuritic chest pain. So think about that case. What, what's on your differential of possibilities that could be causing her symptoms? Um, hopefully with the chest pain and shortness of breath, recognizing that we can have atypical presentations of cardiac emergencies, we're going to do a 12 lead EKG. And I, and I think a 12 lead is very appropriate in this scenario. You know, you, you don't necessarily see any signs of STEMI or anything, but what you're looking at on this 12 lead is, again, look at the precordial leads. Those are, those are the hidden gems. We have, you know, T wave, T waves that are going downward, T wave inversions, and an ST segment changes too depression out into the lateral precordial leads. Um, you know, you get some right heart strain pattern here where we almost get into like a right bundle branch block pattern. So, you know, two V heart and we get um, some right heart strain pattern on your 12 lead EKG. What's going on? It seems like the right side of the heart or the right ventricle is strained because of these patterns. Uh, so this would um, this would be suggestive of a pulmonary embolism. So leg pain could be a blood clot in the leg. It breaks off. It goes through the right side of the heart, lodges in one of the pulmonary arteries or one of the segments of the pulmonary arteries. Uh, and basically, it causes an obstructive shock where you can't push beyond that pulmonary emboli in, in the pulmonary circulation. So the right heart is pushing harder and harder and harder. So you get some of this right heart strain on EKG. This is another ultrasound which I think demonstrates the pathophysiology of a pulmonary embolism. So what we have here is the right atrial and the right ventricle, and then right here is our left ventricle. Pulmonary embolisms are a right-sided heart problem. And in this example, we have actually a thrombus or blood clot in the right atrium, but this could be further upstream in one of the veins too. But this can break off and go to the heart, and then this right ventricle is pushing against that, pushing against that occlusion in the pulmonary artery. So you get the right ventricle getting really, really big and really, really big and straining. Your left ventricle should be bigger than your right ventricle, but in this ultrasound image, the right ventricle is larger than the left ventricle because it's working so hard to push against that pulmonary embolism. So this is, as noted in the upper corner here, right ventricular strain with the thrombus. So this is a, this is a pulmonary embolism that's causing hemodynamic compromise in this patient. Um, a few different treatments for this in the hospital from a pre-hospital perspective is supportive care, airway breathing, circulation, and keep this on your differential as well. Um, in the hospital, this can be treated um, sometimes endovascularly, sometimes we can give clot busters, and sometimes uh, even surgery, depending on various circumstances. So I think right heart strain on your EKG, as we just talked about, could this be pulmonary embolism? So I mentioned a few times here when we talked about tamponade and pulmonary embolism uh, obstructive shock, and I just wanted to mention briefly the types of shock. So this is, when we talk about shock, it's, it's a pump problem. There's not enough blood with oxygen in it getting to tissues. So the, the oxygen and nutrient demands of tissues is not being met by the heart, and that's basically the definition of shock. And we can have different types of shock as listed on the screen here. Hypovolemic can be you know, decrease fluid in, in the blood or actually decrease blood like hemorrhagic shock. Um, and we see this a lot. 
obstructive shock, that's going to be your tension pneumos, that's going to be your PE, that's going to be your pericardial tamponade, where you're obstructing blood flow back to the heart. So it's a preload problem. Uh, trauma, where we have um, where we have decreased sympathetic tone, uh, and we have findings of hypotension and bradycardia in the setting of a spinal trauma. Distributive shock, we see this a lot as well. This is going to be where the blood vessels dilate, the pipes get bigger. You go from a six inch water main to a 12 inch water main, you keep the same amount of water in it, you're not gonna be able to get that water out to where you need to go. Uh, and examples of this are gonna be sepsis and anaphylaxis. In both of those cases, it's abnormal inflammation, one caused from infection and one caused from an allergic reaction that caused the pipes to dilate, that caused distributive problems. You can't get blood out, you can't distribute the blood. Uh, and then we can see cardiogenic shock, and sometimes that's tough to pick up in the out-of-hospital setting, and it can present in a variety of different ways, but that's an actual problem with the pump. So in most of these, giving a bolus of fluid is going to be just fine. It's not going to uh, have too much harm, and it may help fix some of the problems. Uh, and some of these, it, you know, it's not going to help very much at all, and you need to think about some other treatments that you can do. But in most of these, the first step is getting fluid back into the pipes, back into the blood vessel system before you move on. I wanted to just touch on uh, vasopressors in the pre-hospital setting. And I know there's some agencies that will calculate drip rates and they have the drip set up and everything too. That's, that's a great way to do things. Um, there's been a somewhat of a push from a pre-hospital perspective to utilize a dirty epi drip when you need some vasopressor support in the out-of-hospital setting. And the, the nice thing about a dirty epi drip is that it's pretty easy to do, and it takes a lot of the technicality about calculating drip rates and all that stuff um, out of a stressful situation. And uh, it, it allows you to provide some sympathetic tone to maybe buy you some time so you can resuscitate before you have to intubate, et cetera, uh, and stabilize the patient. I'm a proponent of the dirty epi drip um, in the right clinical scenario. It's pretty easy to make. You put one milligram of epi in one liter of normal saline. You run it wide open to clinical effect. You got to watch out for blood pressures, watch out for perfusion, um, make sure your IV is good. Um, but it's a good concentration. And they say if, if it goes through a 16 or 18 gauge IV through the, for, um, through the, through the antecubital fossa, that you get about 20 micrograms per hour. Um, or 20 micrograms per minute, sorry, and then you can titrate to clinical effect as well. So it's a nice, it's a nice way to uh, get some epi and buy yourself some time in the pre-hospital setting. All right, this is a 53-year-old male that presents with shortness of breath. Um, you arrive on scene and, you know, borderline hypoxia, maybe 88, 90 percent. Um, he's working hard to breathe. Uh, his respiratory rate's high. U12 EDKG, and he's in this rhythm here. So looking at this rhythm, you know, um, maybe you see some P waves in there. You know, maybe this is, um, you, you know, maybe this is a, some flutter waves in there. Maybe you see that you have a narrow complex um, irregular rhythm. So you, if it, you know, you think that it's coming super ven super ventricularly. Uh, you look at the comorbidities, and he has a history of heart problems. He has diabetes, hypertension, hyperlipidemia, et cetera. So, you know, you're thinking maybe this is cardiogenic shortness of breath. And, um, you know, you, you kind of go down, could this be CHF rather than our COPD, pneumonia, asthma type picture too? And, uh, you know, you think about some lung sounds that you can hear with CHF or decompensated heart failure. Typically, they're going to be wet lung sounds, so crackles. And you can see some extremity edema as well. Look at the past medical history. If there's a history of CHF, then likely this could be a presentation of decompensated heart failure. So um, heart failure can be decompensated or compensated. And most of the time when we're called on cardiac emergencies, it's going to be decompensated heart failure. And um, look at your EKG. Look at your past medical history. Your physical exam is going to be really key. Do you see signs and symptoms of volume overload? Um, what do your lung sounds sound like? Um, the three big things for decompensated heart failure, get an EKG, because sometimes the heart failure can be, rather than, than acute on chronic, sometimes it can be acute from an acute STEMI or valve rupture, et cetera. So get a 12 lead, it can give you some good information. And then the two most important things you can do, 
especially for hypertensive uh, decompensated heart failure, CPAP and nitroglycerin. That's going to do a lot of good things for the heart. It's going to decrease the work of breathing. Uh, it's going to stent open those alveoli that are filled with fluid from the heart failure. And it's going to decrease the workload of the heart as well. The same thing with nit nitroglycerin. So CPAP and nitro are very, very important to get started as soon as possible in the out-of-hospital setting for decompensated heart failure. All right, this is our next case here. This is... Um, this is a 71-year-old female that was found down on the ground after falling a day ago, and she was laying on the ground for almost a day. Neighbor found her, and then you're called for um, found down altered mental status. So you do a bunch of stuff that you would do for an altered mental status evaluation in the field. And, you know, blood glucose is normal. You look for trauma. There's no evidence of, of major trauma. So you do a 12 EDKG, and you see this. Here. So this is a weird looking EKG. You think wide complex, no P waves, wide complex. Um, what's on my differential? You know, could this be ventricular tachycardia? This is a wide complex tachycardia. Could it be VTAC? Could it be cardiac and etiology? Uh, but what else could be causing this? Is there uh, a reason why there would be a metabolic cause of wide complex tachycardia? One of those that could cause wide complex could be uh, a tricyclic antidepressant overdose or a TCA overdose can cause wide QRS. Another common thing is hyperkalemia or high potassium levels. So in this patient, being down for a day could lead to crush injury, which could lead to high potassium. Uh, folks that miss dialysis, folks with chronic renal disease and stage renal disease are at risk for high potassium levels. And potassium can cause this wide complex tachycardia which in the setting of uh, potassium, we refer to as a sine wave pattern. So you kind of see in some of these leads where we go up and down, up and down, up and down, like a sine wave in, tri in uh, trig class. So th this is a sinusoidal waveform pattern or a sine pattern. And that can be suggestive of hyperkalemia. So in the right clinical setting, when you, when you, suggest, when you expect hyperkalemia, you know, we can get treatment started. Calcium is a great way to stabilize the cardiac uh, Membranes stabilize the cardiac cells uh, from further detrimental effects of high potassium. And then things like sodium bicarbonate and albuterol can help push potassium back into the cells and decrease the serum level of, of the potassium. And then for those of you that use RSI, and in particular um, use paralysis with succinylcholine, suspected hyperkalemia would be a contraindication to using succinylcholine as well. It can cause decompensation of the patient. So um, keep hyperkalemia on the differential for wide complex tachycardia. Other things you'll find on an EKG will be hyperacute or peak T waves and then interval prolongations as well. All right, so that's more of a metabolic external cause. And now we're going to get into some electrical causes of cardiac emergencies. And uh, we move over here and we see... Uh, this is an EKG of a 17-year-old um, female that had a syncopal episode while sitting at school. Uh, so she lost consciousness, and then she, by the time you arrive, she's back to baseline. Syncope, when we talk about syncope, the definition of syncope is transient loss of consciousness with loss of postural tone with quick return to baseline. So you lose consciousness quickly, you pass out quickly, you come back to fairly quickly, which differentiates it from a seizure. And when you pass out, you lose control of your body, so you fall over. So that's the definition of syncope. And then near syncope would be somebody that feels like they're gonna syncopize, but does not completely lose consciousness. So near syncope, syncope, uh, they can be suggestive of cardiac problems of, uh, of, the, of the cause of the syncope. Sometimes it's neurogenic cause of syncope. A lot of times what we deal with is vasovagal where, where we have just changes in blood vessel tone where we go from laying to sitting or sitting to standing and we just don't get enough blood flow going to our brain. But there's that cardiac etiology consideration for syncope patients. And it can happen in young patients, middle-aged patients, and older patients. So getting a 12 lead when, when somebody has that syncope complaint is very important. And this is an example of a young girl presenting after a syncope event that we do an EKG on. And what we find here is, you know, P 
waves before every QRS. Uh, there's no ST segment changes or anything, but we look at our intervals and we look at our Q wave going to our T wave, Q wave, um, T wave, Q wave, T wave, that's long. Uh, so this is a prolonged QT interval. And prolonged QT intervals can be caused by anatomical problems that people are born with. Uh, they can also be caused by acquired problems such as medications. And there's a million different medications that can cause prolonged QT intervals. Uh, and the danger, especially when the QT interval gets over 500, is you can progress to a more malignant rhythm as evidenced here. So prolonged QT on the left-hand side of your EKG progressing into this polymorphic uh, ventricular tachycardia on the right-hand side of the EKG. It's a polymorphic VTAC. So this would be an example of prolonged QTC interval. So you basically drop off and then you decompensate into a, a torsades pattern that we're seeing on the right-hand side of the screen. So that's the danger with prolonged QT intervals is you can decompensate in, into a malignant cardiac rhythm. VTAC, polymorphic VTAC, torsades, and even v, uh, VFib as well. So look for that prolonged QT interval. If it's greater than 500, that's extremely concerning uh, for potential cardiac decompensation. All right. This is another, um, let's say, uh, you know, adolescent that passed out uh, while sitting uh, at school. And what we have here is the EKG afterwards, back to normal and we're looking for any kind of electrical abnormality. So what's wrong with the wiring of the heart? And we go through here and again, P before every QRS, you know, there's maybe some ST segment changes here in the precordial leads, but sometimes you can have those kind of changes with, with um, adolescent EKGs. But look at some of these intervals here. So the PR interval is a little short and then you got this upsloping aspect of the wave here, you know, and that's, um, this is an example of a delta wave. So delta wave um, with the PR interval. Uh, when you see that, it's concerning for Wolf Parkinson White or WPW syndrome, which is another electrical problem with the heart. And uh, the concerning part of this is with WPW syndrome, there's different pathways besides the typical pathway from the SA node through the AV node to the ventricles. You can go through different pathways between the atria and the ventricle. And depending on the direction of impulse through the heart, basically the direction of how electricity flows throughout the heart, um, people can decompensate when they have uh, WPW syndrome into a um, irregular tachydysrhythmia that we're seeing on the screen here, which can, which can cause um, decreased perfusion and then can decompensate into a pulseless VTAC, uh, VFib cardiac arrest as well. So you got to be careful with the medications that you give here. Typically, these folks will present unstable and will require cardioversion to be knocked out of that malignant rhythm. So this is a um, this is a 16 year old male uh, at football practice. Uh, at the time of this recording, we're in August, so two days are starting um, at least practices for high school football right now. And what we see here is uh, he was uh, doing sprints and passed out. When you arrive on scene, he's back to normal. Uh, doesn't really have any complaints, but you do this 12 lead EKG, and what are we finding here? Again, P wave before every QRS. Um, intervals look okay, but we see, um, we see these odd T wave and ST segment changes, again, in the precordial leads. We keep talking about the precordial leads. Some T wave inversion here, maybe some poor R wave regression where these R waves are much bigger than over here, whereas you should progress through that when you have um, normal conduction. So this is an EKG example of uh, hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy, where basically the left ventricle becomes so large, becomes so enlarged, uh, it causes obstruction of the outflow track going from the left ventricle to the aorta so you can get basically just re reduction in cardiac output through the aortic valve, and that can lead to syncope. It can also, um, it can also decompensate into uh, VFib, VTAC cardiac arrest. Our last uh, EKG that we're gonna talk about demonstrating an electrical problem, this is a 23 year old that uh, passed out while working in a warehouse. Um, he, returns back to normal by the time you get there. 
and um, doesn't have any symptoms. And again, this is the 12 lead that you get here. And looking at this EKG, uh, the things that stand out, again, in these precordial leads here, we have this weird kind of downsloping biphasic ST segment and T wave, V1, V2, and V3. And uh, you notice some other weird ST segment changes in the other leads too, but this is where we're looking at V1, V2, V3. This is an example of another cardiac conduction problem. Uh, and this is an example of Brugada syndrome, where we have abnormal channels uh, that are in the heart, which basically are, are responsible for conducting the electrical impulses and coordinating that with contractions in the heart. And uh, folks with Brugada-like pattern uh, can decompensate into uh, a malignant tachydysrhythmia, pulseless VTAC, and ventricular fibrillation uh, cardiac arrest too. So this is another concerning finding uh, that can be present uh, that suggests an electrical problem in somebody that may be completely returned to normal by the time you evaluate them in a pre-hospital setting. So for all of these, we're not necessarily going to fix these problems, but we need to make sure that we're saying, hey, this looks very concerning, relaying that to the patient, to the parents, and making sure that we get them to the hospital to get evaluated. So we talked about several syncope patients here. I wanted to mention briefly uh, we go on a lot of syncope, and whether it's found down or altered mental status or whatever the dispatch type is, a lot of these things are syncope, the transient loss of consciousness with, with loss of postural tone and return to baseline, either near syncope or syncope. The things you got to watch out for. So most of the time when it's just syncope from going from a sitting to a standing position, for example, that's going to be vasovagal syncope, and that's going to be the majority of what we're dealing with. And that's going to be benign. It's going to resolve on its own. There's certain red flags that we should look at when we're talking about syncope and, and evaluating our patients. So when syncope occurs while sitting or resting and not moving, think dysrhythmia, sudden onset of a bad cardiac problem. Chest pain with syncope, think pulmonary embolism. Headache with syncope, think subarachnoid hemorrhage. So that sudden burst of an aneurysm causing the head bleed can cause syncope. Abdominal pain plus syncope, think a ruptured AAA or an aortic dissection where you have that aneurysm pops again and it causes syncope. On exertion, you get concerned about hypertrophic cardiomyopathy and LVH and enlarged hearts. And then when, when it happens over and over and over again, without, you know, faster than it should, then we also think dysrhythmia. And these are all, uh, not necessarily all cardiac emergencies, but kind of gets in, grouped into that cardiac emergency because syncope is uh, sometimes grouped into a cardiac emergency as well. A few more cases here. This is an example of uh, a um, just an overall external trauma to the pump function of the heart. So, uh, external trauma. This was a um, this was a teenage girl that was in an MVC that uh, complained of chest pain after being in a restrained accident. Um, I got this image from this was a case report in the Annals of Emergency Medicine. And this was her EKG following the accident. Again, complaining of chest pain and no other injuries. And what we see here in the rhythm strips is evidence of third degree heart block where we don't have P waves before every QRS. The R to R interval is consistent. The P to P interval, if you look in here, you gotta use your imagination to, to find some hidden P waves. Uh, but if you look at the P wave interval, they're the same, they're, they're consistent, but they're not ma matching up so this is an example of a third degree heart block following blunt cardiac trauma. So this is concerning. Obviously, there can be decompensation from that. So trauma to the chest, cardiac trauma, you can have things that basically a left ventricle that's bruised, or you can knock out a coronary artery so you can damage the plumbing, or you can knock out the electricity where you have blocks and stuff that happen after blunt cardiac trauma. All right. We talked a little bit about um, VTAC and Y complex tachycardia. So, this is a Y complex tachycardia, and uh, this is suggestive of VTAC. There are some algorithms out there that you can use to help differentiate VTAC from SVT with aberrancy. Uh, none are really super reliable for clinical indications, especially when it's going to change our management if we go down the SVT versus the VTAC route. So, Y complex tachycardia, for the most part, you treat as a VTAC especially if they have cardiac risk factors. And this looks like a monomorphic 
uh, regular Y-complex tachycardia, um, which is different than our irregular polymorphic VTACs, which have a much higher rate of decompensation into cardiac arrest. So this is Y-complex monomorphic uh, VTAC. I just wanted to mention um, some information on antidysrhythmics in the setting of stable VTAC. So if you have somebody that's unstable in a wide complex rhythm, then you typically don't have a cardioversion route. But if you have somebody that just maybe has some palpitations, but everything else looks good, vitals are good, perfusion is good, you don't necessarily need to cardiovert that in a pre-hospital setting. Some protocols don't call for any treatment in this situation. Some call for the use of an antidysrhythmic. Some say amio, some say lidocaine. Procanamide is another option too. I wanted to highlight this really cool study from a few years back. It's the Procamio study, and it compared procanamide and amiodarone for the treatment of tolerated wide QRS uh, tachycardia, uh, so, so basically stable regular VTAC. And they found that procanamide uh, performed a little bit better. I'll refer you to the slides for the details. And it had less side effects than amiodarone. So I know a lot of us use amiodarone or even lidocaine, but uh, procanamide has been uh, pushed somewhat now based on the study for the treatment of, of um, ventricular tachycardia as well um, with a pulse. Um, most agencies, most protocols call for the use of amiodarone and or lidocaine for pulses VTAX. You know, what I'm talking about here is somebody with a pulse. But this is interesting, and, and I'm curious to see how this goes in the future as well. All right. So this is uh, somebody that comes in. This is a young girl that's otherwise healthy. Healthy. She's 33 years old. Uh, she had the flu a couple weeks ago, and now she, she's just never really gotten her energy back. And now has severe fatigue and shortness of breath and chest pain uh, with a mild fever. And um, think about what you would do for this patient. You know, this could be a lot of different things. Uh, but hopefully, when you get her heart rate, you know, you notice it's pretty darn fast, about 150 or so. So you, you, you do a 12-lead EKG, and this is what you're seeing on the EKG. You know, P waves, T waves, this looks like a sinus tachycardia. Um, one thing to keep in mind, especially after viral illnesses like the flu or anything, really, is the concept of just like we can have things happen outside of the heart, we can have inflammation and infection of the actual cardiac muscles. And this is an example of myocarditis uh, following a viral illness, uh, which can lead to symptoms of heart failure. A lot of times the tachycardia is going to be disproportionate to the clinical status of the patient. So 150, but up talking to you, no hemodynamic instability. Uh, so th consider that in your workup, especially in somebody with heart failure symptoms. Sometimes it can be myocarditis as the cause of that. And then lastly, you know, we can have inflammation and infection of the cardiac muscle, uh, but we can also have inflammation and infection within the heart, so the endocardium. And um, all these are pictures and stuff that are associated with infective endocarditis. So um, going here to the ultrasound here, this is a picture of one of the valves. And you see how it's bright white? It shouldn't be like that. It should be like over here. Um, but it's bright white, right? and this is actually on ultrasound suggestive of an infection that's living on one of the valves. So a vegetation is what we talk about. This would be an example of vegetation living on one of the valves here as we look at the heart. And what happens is you, you get basically this ball of bacteria or fungus or whatever that's living in the heart, and some of it breaks off and it travels up to the brain, to the extremities, to the belly, to the lungs, and you can get things like basically septic emboli. So in base, um, instead of it being a blood clot, it's a ball of infection that's, that's being embolized throughout the body. So you can get um, altered mental status and edema of the brain. You can get severe pneumonia. You can get ischemia to the gut and to the legs. And you see some of these patterns here. On the fingernail, that's a splinter hemorrhage associated with infective endocarditis. You can get um, these uh, bleeding areas. This is the conjunctiva, so right underneath the eyelid. And you can get these uh, discolorations and rashes, these nodes on the palms and the soles as well. And all this is indicative of infective endocarditis. Uh, there's a very high mor morbidity and mortality that's associated with infective endocarditis. Uh, so these folks can be really sick. And sometimes they present just with like a viral illness or with the flu. So it can be pretty subtle to pick up sometimes. But keep it in your differential. Folks that have a history of heart, um, 
heart surgery, congenital heart disease, uh, invasive procedures, as well as IV drug use can also be at risk for infective endocarditis. All right, so in summary, again, cardiac emergencies, there are pump problems, there's plumbing problems, there's electrical problems, and then there's external problems that affect the heart. Um, a 12 lead EKG is gonna be your friend. It's gonna help pick up a lot of those plumbing, electrical, and pump problems. Uh, think about the other stuff like high potassium and uh, some other external things that can cause uh, the heart to be strained and can, and can make you think cardiac emergency. But again, that 12 lead, that early 12 lead is gonna be very beneficial to help you narrow down what the emergency is and decrease time to defensive care and get the patient to the hospital and give them the best chance of, of surviving with the best outcome from their cardiac emergency. I wanna thank you for your time. Hopefully you learned something. Uh, again, if you have any questions, comments, or feedback, please feel free to reach out to me at eric.cortez at ohiohealth.com. I look forward to hearing from you, and I hope you enjoy the rest of the summer update. Thank you.